So for the last talk of the morning session, I'm pleased to introduce uh, Nick Holloway. Uh, Nick's somebody else who, if you've been to one of these uh, before, you'll, uh, you'll know very well. Uh, he's, I think, this, responsible for the uh, getting the ed ed education track started at the conference. Uh, tomorrow we've got, we've got a bunch of teachers and trainee teachers turning up, and on Saturday we've, we've got some kids coming for their kids' day. Uh, Nick's present to uh, thank or, or blame for this. Uh, he's going <laughs> to uh, tell us a bit about Python in education. But there's one more uh, thank you. Uh, Nick stood in at the last minute to give this talk uh, because uh, I didn't think it had pulled out. So, um, uh, well, thank you. thanks. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'm Nicholas. <laughs> so, uh, you guys obviously had the big breakfasts. Um, so, uh, yes, I'm improvising now because I only found out I was doing this talk yesterday morning. Um, so, uh, please bear with me. So, I'm going to talk about Python education. And I'd just like to say it's also great to see that we've got the closed captioning going on here as well. I think you're missing a trick, though. We should do it sort of like Star Wars, so it goes away in the background, like the <laughs> opening rolling credits or something like that. Um, so Python education, I used to be a teacher. Uh, I was a music teacher, very passionate about teaching and education. Uh, O'Reilly asked me to write a, a pamphlet for them, uh, which is what I've done, and there it is. Um, and what I'm going to do is just talk very quickly uh, and give you three stories, essentially. Um, but I'm assuming something, uh, and that is that a good developer is always learning and reevaluating in order to improve. Um, and that reflects on you, uh, not just the students or the teachers that I may be talking about as well. Um, you don't want to be that, uh, that developer stuck in the 1970s, um, like perhaps our curriculum. So how do you do that? With education. Uh, so I'm going to tell you three stories. There's uh, personal uh, education, a story of community education, and, uh, well, a, a story of sort of national education, really. Uh, and this is the sort of the Frankenstein monster of three talks that I splotted together at about nine o'clock this morning. So. <laughs> so the first story, personal story. Uh, the Python Dojo. How many of you have been to the London Python Dojo? So, you'll be all familiar with this. <laughs> so, the dojo, how did that start? Uh, in about 2008, I was a uh, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed new Python developer. I was already an experienced developer, um, but I wanted to learn Python. I wanted to learn from people who were better than me at Python. Um, and some friends of mine and myself, we set up this dojo. And uh, what do we do in the dojo? Well, it's sort of social coding. If you imagine people go to the pub and they talk about football and things like that, well, at the dojo, you go along, you drink beer, and you talk about code, and you actually do coding. And how does that happen? Well, uh, Karen, um, uh, another sort of famous Python person in the, in the UK, um, I say another because his mum, Mary, Mooney is uh, running around like a headless chicken as we speak uh, because she's one of the organisers of this conference. So Karen, her son, uh, suggested that uh, what we should do is get into small groups and work together to solve problems. And um, uh, that sounded like a really good idea because uh, if you're in a small group, you get to find out what all the other people in your group are doing and, uh, and then um, you can learn something. What do you know? I'm not improvising, honest. Okay, so how do we run a dojo? Well, the first thing we do is we socialize because people who come along to the dojo, they might be new people in, in our community, like I was once new, and we want them to feel relaxed and welcome um, to our community. So uh, like the slide says, we have a, a bunch of nerds and we have nerd bait in the form of beer and pizza and other things that, that we give people. It lets them relax. And while we're doing that, what we do is we write on a board a bunch of computing problems. So uh, this is a zero organization uh, sort of event because we make it up as we go along, just like this talk. Um, so uh, we write a whole bunch of computing problems on the board. Um, and uh, when we finished our pizza and our beer, uh, we vote on uh, which of those problems appears to be the most interesting to those 30 or so people who are in the room who've come along to, to learn about Python. Um, and then what we do is we, we get into groups of, of five or, or so, and, and we spend about an hour and a half coding in teams. Uh, you can see some of them there. This is from about, I don't know, uh, 2009, 2010. 
And then at the very end is my favourite part of the evening, and that is show and tell, uh, which is just like the live demo you saw from, uh, from Andrew, uh, where people have to stand up and demo the code that solves the problem that we chose from the board at the beginning. Um, often that breaks or it doesn't work or it doesn't quite go to plan, uh, but that's a good thing because uh, you are uh, in a room full of friends here. Um, then you explain your code as well. Uh, and people ask you questions. So what are you doing as a team? So it's not you on your own, you're stood there with your teammates um, and you're doing a live code review and people are interrogating you about the way that you, um, the way that you solve the problem. This is interesting, okay, because uh, in a dojo we learn by doing this deliberate practice, okay? We've all come together to try and code together and learn from each other. Um, and uh, this is one of my favorites, we fail safely with sympathy. Uh, because everybody's solving the same problem, everybody's head is in the same problem space, and so you know what the different, uh, how the problem might be difficult, or how it might be easy, or uh, you know some of the ways in which uh, the problem might be tricky. Okay, um, and because it's a supportive um, atmosphere, we fail with sympathy. Okay, so you don't laugh at people's failures, as it were, um, and we teach one another. So um, in these groups of about five, you might have somebody who's a core Python developer, so they write the actual Python programming language, somebody who's just been learning for a week. Um, and we organize things so that uh, we make it the responsibility for the expert Python programmers in the room to act as mentors and teachers. And we make it especially clear for the beginner programmers uh, that we want them to ask questions. So the stupid question is the question that you don't ask. Okay, just ask questions. And if the person replies, and it might as well be in Klingon, then it's their problem because they have not simplified the solution, the answer, um, well enough to you. It, and this is a good thing for experienced developers to, uh, to actually do because a lot of what we do as developers is ex explaining to each other how our code works. As I just put there, uh, wasn't that good. Um, so we are, we are learning to explain uh, to each other. Um, and because there's, I don't know, four or five groups in the room, and each one has done a, a slightly different solution to the same problem, like I said, everybody's head is in the same problem space, um, uh, we're able to sort of explore each other's solutions um, and work out what's, uh, uh, what, what's, um, what's going on. Um, and, of course, uh, we're building a community. Okay, so this is practical, community-led, educational uh, event um, that's made up on the spot. Okay, um, and we we're talking about community, um, and we're here at, at PyCon UK. So the second story I want to tell you about PyCon education is is this uh, is, is this about community education and how that has affected um, something that Peter talked about the uh, the education track here. So. Um, <clears throat> how many, I, okay, I might, hmm, how can I put this? If you were at school in the 90s or the 2000s, could you put your hands up? Okay. Uh, if you were at school in the 80s, put your hands up. So I was 80s, 90s crossover, okay. Okay, so... In the 1980s, it was awesome because there were BBC micros and things and you could do all sorts of wonderful things. From the 90s onwards, until very recently, uh, it was all, let's learn Microsoft Word or let's do a PowerPoint or something like that. Okay? Uh, I know this because I was a teacher at that time as well. Um, it was uh, not very good. Um, and uh, often the computing curriculum was delivered by people who weren't actually computing specialists. These were business studies teachers who could rustle up a nice spreadsheet or something like that, okay? Um, and there was no actual programming. Um, we're here at a programming conference, so I, I hope that you're sympathetic to my cause, that actually teaching programming is, is perhaps an interesting and important skill uh, for students to learn. Um, so, uh, of course, there's the famous Raspberry Pi. We've all sort of touched on it in each of our three talks now, um, this morning. Um, it's, uh, people say, you know, uh, it's inspiration in a box. Well, it, it's not. It's not inspiration in a box because there is no box, and that's the point. You can see what's in a Raspberry Pi, and you can start to poke around with it and plug things in and do the little hat thing that, that Andy did and, and so on and so forth, okay? It's, it's asking people to, to interact with it. Um, it runs Python 3. 
uh, and it's a worldwide success. Um, and I think it was last week, I believe, 10 million units shipped, which makes it uh, you know, one of the most popular uh, UK computers. Um, so because of uh, the success of the Raspberry Pi and the fact that Eric Schmidt uh, embarrassed Michael Gove in a press conference talking about how this is the land of Tim Berners-Lee, uh, Alan Turing and Charles Babbage and Ada Lovelace and you've got a really shonky computing curriculum, uh, people have changed the computing curriculum. Okay. Um, now, if you remember a few minutes ago, I mentioned that a lot of the teachers of computing in schools were not subject specialists. Okay. Um, and uh, as was mentioned by Russell earlier on uh, in, um, in, in the uh, first session, um, a lot of the teachers don't have the skills to be able to, uh, to teach programming. Um, and so I want to sort of dwell a little bit on teachers at the moment, uh, having been one myself. Um, it's a very important job because teaching is the one profession that creates all the other professions. Um, and it's certainly a calling because you're not doing it for the fast cars and the jet set lifestyle. Uh, and you're certainly not doing it for the holidays. Um, when do you think you got your GCSE papers marked and things like that? If you think teachers are swanning it around uh, in holidays, they're not, I can assure you. Uh, and having been a teacher, having done some really awful jobs as a student and as a sort of a senior level developer now, I can safely say that teaching was the most challenging and difficult job that I ever had to do by a huge a, a order of magnitude, okay? I have nothing but respect for teachers, and this is why we wanted to start the education track here at PyCon UK. Um, so, this is what we tried to do. This is the very first uh, um, teacher's track. At PyCon UK, I can see some people in this room are in this photograph here, uh, and some people who have gone on to fame and fortune. Uh, so uh, uh, if you look in the middle, it, there's Carrie Ann, who's now the head of education at the Raspberry Pi Foundation, who does amazing work. And uh, she came to PyCon UK back in 2011, 2012, and she met her husband for the first time at PyCon UK, and I was at their wedding last weekend, which was rather awesome. Uh, but don't clap me. <laughs> See you tomorrow and wish you congratulations and things. Um, <laughs> so what we wanted to do is engage with these remarkable people, these teachers who might not have the skills, but they have the passion and the dedication uh, to deliver this curriculum. And uh, so what we wanted to do was connect them with developers. And uh, what we found, and I'm going to use Dan Pope, who's not here, um, as an example, Dan is an exceptionally talented Python developer. He's the... Uh, Pi Week Python Games Programming Champion twice or something like that, okay? Um, and essentially, Dan writes a computer game from scratch in a week, okay? And it's an international competition and people believe that he's done the best one twice, okay? Uh, he came along and uh, he worked with some of the teachers and he wanted to help them write games with Python. And so, not knowing what teachers were up against, all of us swung into the room and sat down at the laptops and said, OK, have you got Python installed on this? No. It's a Windows laptop, Windows XP. Ah. OK, well, that's all right. We can, uh, we can just install it. OK, let's go to the Python website, download Python. Python's downloaded. We can't install it. Why not? Because it's locked down and we're not allowed to install things on our laptops. Ah. OK, well, let's go to pythonanywhere.com. They'll like the plug. Um, Oh, no, we can't because it's IE6 and uh, IE6 doesn't work with pythonanywhere.com. And uh, in the first half hour of that day, uh, we realised that we were uh, kind of on a sinking ship, really. Um, so we had to do something. So Dan uh, gets out his laptop and has a group of teachers huddling around him. And he's sort of, um, uh, you know, when you're doing uh, your driving lessons and uh, your instructor goes, right, then, Mr. Solvay, I want you to tell me what you're thinking while you're driving so they can see that, you know, you say, I've done look in the mirror, I'm going to put the brakes on, okay, I'm going to indicate now, I, I see there's an old lady in front, so I'm going to adjust my speed, and this sort of stream of consciousness that, that you have so that they can see what you're thinking and how you are making decisions as you drive a car, uh, not only is that reassuring for the driving instructor, but it also demonstrates that you know what you're doing. Uh, this is what Dan was doing here. Okay, the first thing I want to do when I write a game is blah, 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 and off he went. And he had, I don't know, 100 lines of code, which to a Python developer is not a lot of code. 
okay? But for teachers, at the very end, they were a great game, really love it, but we couldn't do that with our children. Uh, because it's going to take us half an hour anyway to get them all set up and blah, 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 blah. So Dan, um, Dan uh, decided that he would create a library for children for programming games. And the way he did that is he took Pygame, which is the um, library that uh, Python programmers use for writing games, and he created uh, what we call a shim or a wrapper around it uh, called Pygame Zero. And uh, if you see him, uh, ask him this weekend to, to show you. In fact, there might even be a talk about Pi Game Zero. Uh, go along and see it, because it's remarkable what he's done. Uh, because with just an empty Python file, you get a valid game, and you get a screen on there. And you start adding bits to this, this game, and you, you, you can build a, a very simple Pac-Man very, very quickly. Um, this makes it very engaging for, for students, and more importantly, uh, teachers get to understand what's going on as well. But perhaps the most fundamental aspect of this is that if you're an advanced student or you're a teacher who wants to know more, you can peek behind the curtain and have a look at the Pi Game library that's underneath. Now, this is quite a, a, an interesting philosophy that, that, that Dan put forward with, um, with Pi Game Zero, and others have copied it. So we now have a GPIO Zero, and we have a Network Zero. Um, um, we may have a... a MQPP zero or something like that uh, coming along and they all follow that sort of a philosophy and that's because we connected developers with teachers okay they're not kind of two I don't know tribes or something we want them to work together okay so you can do that tomorrow you're probably all developers in this room so please come to the education track tomorrow you'll see lots of nervous looking teachers because um, while we might think of teachers as you know you remember that really awful teacher who taught you French at school and ugh, that's how all teachers are because you know we build up prejudices and things like that um, and they think we're all a bunch of kind of I don't know gobbledygook talking brain boxes who, who, with, with social problems because we sort of, you know, okay? That's not the case at all. We know that. This is prejudice. And uh, where there's prejudice, we can break that down. So please come along to the education track and talk to teachers. But we have a monkey infestation as well on Saturday when we invite all the kids to come along. Um, and, uh, well, I'm just going to show you a series of photographs. This was PyCon UK two or three years ago. And uh, that's William and Amelia, and they are using a Raspberry Pi and Python to program Minecraft, which, uh, if you know anything about children these days, is like a kind of alignment of the planets in terms of what's cool. Okay, Minecraft, Python, Raspberry Pi, awesome. Okay, and they're trying to do something, and there's a problem. Hmm. Oh, dear. <laughs> it says something like syntax error or something, and Big Brother Sam has arrived as well. Uh, but Sam, because he's been doing some other Python with somebody else, is pointing out the problem. This is pair programming we've got going on here. Look at this. Wow. And, oh, they've pressed, the, is it going to work? Oh, oh, it's getting close, getting close. Yes, the code runs, it's deployed, the tests are green, or whatever it is that you do is your day job, you can empathize with exactly that journey that the children have had uh, whilst trying to fix that, whatever it was. I think they were trying to build a bridge in Minecraft out of blocks of lava so that the bridge would just melt away. Okay. Um, where's the teacher? There was no teacher. They were autonomously learning. Okay? Kids have this incredible capacity for exploration and fun. And the things that we were talking about earlier on, the three of us that speak, who were speaking today, uh, you know, let's build a cat flat with rockets in it. You know, what could possibly go wrong? Kids have this amazing imagination and inhibition. And this is what we're seeing here. Um, so uh, why are we investing all this time in helping children uh, connect with Python and helping teachers uh, train um, so that they understand how to use Python. Well, I was in an argument about this on Facebook once, and this is basically the summary that I gave. I'll read it to you. This is uh, called PowerPoint Karaoke, so here we go. Asking what sort of education and learning our community supports is how we decide what sort of community we become. For it is through education and learning that we engage with our future colleagues, friends, and supporters. Because in 10 years' time, they might be asking you um, questions in a job interview. So, that's my second story. That's how our Python, uh, PyCon UK, our, um, uh, our community has engaged with education. I want to finally close with um, <coughs> excuse me, a story about national education. Okay, So we've talked about personal education, people on their own going to a dojo, 
We've talked about a community, our community, engaging. Um, and now we're talking about perhaps something on a rather larger scale. Who remembers these? Yeah, okay. Showing your age. So, let's see. That's what a BBCB really looked like. My dad was a head teacher, and every school in the UK was given a BBC Micro. And he brought one home one day, and my brother and I, it took us about half an hour to prize it out of his hands and uh, get our little mitts on it. And, uh, you know, the first thing I typed was something like that, which was obviously a mistake. Uh, but happily, the BBC uh, Micro told me that it was a mistake. And eventually, I learned about this thing called BASIC. And this was essentially my first BASIC program. So 10... CLS, what does that mean, somebody? Yes, Clear the screen. Oh, all these old timers in the room. 20, print. You are an idiot. Whoops. <laughs> idiot. Yeah, okay. Um, what's line 30 going to be? Go D20. <laughs> Go D20. Hey, that was my first basic <laughs> program. But. The eight or nine year old me, when I made that happen, because the example in the manual was a lot more pleasant than that, it was, hello there Nicholas, or something like that, but you are an idiot. I made the computer tell me I was an idiot, or it was actually my brother, but anyway. <laughs> the point is, is that at that moment, I realised that I could make the computer do this remarkable thing. And if I only knew what the right incantation was, or the right way of making this thing work. I could make this computer do anything. And that was the sort of the legacy of the BBC Micro, was that you had a whole bunch of people of a certain age <coughs> uh, who went into software and computing, hardware, software, that sort of stuff, because they were inspired by um, using the BBC Micro. So you fast forward to a few years ago, uh, a couple of years ago, 18 months ago, oh God, it's only about 18 months ago, um, the BBC said they wanted to do something again uh, that would inspire a new generation. And so um, they launched the microbit. How many of you have heard of the microbit? Okay, so that's, I don't know, maybe 50% of you for the other half. The microbit is a very small computer. It's about the size of a credit card. Uh, it has an LED matrix, which acts as a display, a couple of buttons, some I.O. pins across the bottom. It has an accelerometer and a compass and a very basic radio as well. Uh, so you can sort of make a network of them. Um, and the aim of this project was to inspire a new generation into programming. And teachers were telling, um, we were obviously doing our job well, because teachers were telling the BBC that they wanted Python on the microbit. So um, they approached the PSF, or the PSF became a partner in this project. Um, and uh, MicroPython um, became involved. Um, and uh, I'm not going to talk any more about the microbit, really, uh, because tomorrow, during the Teacher's Day, I'm giving a workshop, so if you're interested, uh, come along to that. Uh, teachers could probably do with programming help, and you could probably uh, have a lot of fun playing with the microbit. Um, on the Saturday, uh, kids are going to get their own microbit, um, and uh, you can come over and you can help them, uh, and you can learn all about uh, what kids, what the crazy things kids do with a microbit. Uh, but the important thing to remember is that this device runs MicroPython, which, as we've learned already, is a version of Python, a re-implementation of Python 3 that runs on microcontrollers. Um, and we've put an awful lot of interesting libraries in there. I get the impression uh, we'll see an awful lot of microbits this weekend, okay, with people playing around with them and things. So uh, I mentioned um, I'm improvising here, uh, but being a teacher, I couldn't uh, not leave you some <laughs> homework. Um, so, uh, <laughs> so on a personal level, what could you do? You could organise a dojo, as I tried to demonstrate. It's a great way for a community a small community to come together and for you to learn from each other. And it doesn't really matter what your skill level is. It's a friendly place. It's relaxed. It takes absolutely no, um, no resources to organize. You just need a projector and a room and perhaps pizza and beer as well if you're into that. Um, I would love you to come to the education track. I'm going to be banging on about this tomorrow morning as well because um, I have a little slot after the keynote to tell you all to do this again. Um, but please come along to the education track. 
lots of developers come in and they have a look and go, well, there's stuff happening. Uh, oh, there's that talk on zero MQ. I'd better go to that then. And they don't uh, actually engage with the teachers. Please come in. And if you see a teacher looking confused or a child looking confused, help them. <clears throat> Be friendly. Let them ask questions, that sort of thing. Uh, you'll find you'll have a captive audience because, like I said, they think we're all like Albert Einstein and talk gobbledygook half the time. Okay, We're not like that. We're friendly people, human beings. Okay? Um, and also, get involved with the wider Python community. Um, how could you possibly do that? You could help uh, people like Peter, who's done an amazing job, and Danielle, who's also done an amazing job, and the other volunteers uh, at making this year's PyCon UK happen. Okay? There are mailing lists that you could join. Uh, there are teach meets that you could go to. Uh, there are all sorts of things you could do. Um, <clears throat> so I'd like this uh, homework done by uh, next year, please, if at all possible. Um, thank you for being so patient. Uh, this was all made up right on the spot. And like I said, you got the Frankenstein's monster version of this talk. Um, and that's it. Thank you very much. So we have time for just one long-winded, self-indulgent question that relates to nothing we've been talking about. Yeah? I would love to get into teaching Python to teachers or kids. What's the best way of doing it? Turn up tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's it. Come along tomorrow. You should come along tomorrow because we have the Raspberry Pi Foundation, whose education team um, first met, more or less, at PyCon UK, and they are an incredibly inspirational group of former teachers who are now um, uh, working doing this. Um, uh, you will also meet Dawn Hewitson, who is the head of the PGC course at Edge Hill University, which Ofsted rated as the best in the country. Uh, so the, teacher, the teachers who learn with her are, are learning about computing education. You know, she's awesome at that. You will also see Martin O'Hanlon, who has written books about Minecraft and uh, Python and things. He does, I, I always love watching Martin because his, talks are, are more like a performance and that they are just a thing of beauty and wonder to, to go and see. You can only see them in the education track, so come along and watch Martin. We had another what question. Sorry? What room is it in? I don't know. Uh, well, <laughs> <laughs> Follow the noise, okay? <laughs> and, the, uh, and tomorrow, follow the pensive looking teachers, okay? And on Saturday, just follow the general chaos. Uh, we've got a question there, and then a question there, and then we should wrap it up because people are hungry. Yeah? Um, so, teaching was actually one of the first thing I, one of the first things I did when shifting careers to programming. Yeah. And I found, it quite, I found that adults, uh, or all teenagers who went to university, uh, were very overwhelmed, especially since they never had. Okay, so I, you're right, I'm going to say come tomorrow, uh, but the answer it depends, okay? The national curriculum states that children from five years old need to learn about programming, okay? And when you're at infant school, you need to have some notion of what an algorithm is. So my youngest son knows what an algorithm is. To him, it's like baking a cake. It's a recipe. If you have some sort of inputs, you know, the sort of the ingredients, and you have some sort of a process, if you follow the process accurately, you will get the same result each time. You know, hopefully a cake or Yorkshire puddings or whatever it was on the British Bake Off yesterday evening. Ha! You weren't watching. Um, so there's that for young kids, okay? It depends on who the child is, um, what age they're at as a, as a class. Um, tomorrow you will see lots of great examples of, of how to do that. Um, especially with groups of adults as well. But I would say that making it fun and making it relevant um, are two key aspects of that. If you turn up and say, well, it's traditional to start with Hello World, then you know, people aren't going to, uh, to, uh, to be particularly interested in tradition. Although I have started classes like that. Danielle. We're at the will of whoever the latest education secretary is. And the successes of the last few years could easily be wiped out by the next buzzer <coughs> who takes up the job. Yeah. <laughs> how frightened, how worried should we be about uh, what's handed down from government? Um, 
with a teacher's hat on. <laughs> I'm always worried. Um, I, I was a teacher for about 10 years, and every year, every damn year, they would change something. They being the bureaucracy. Uh, education in the UK is top down. You have Ofsted, the Office for Standards in Education. Um, that's a big stick to hit teachers with. If you actually try it tomorrow, just to say, my brother's an Ofsted inspector, to them, <laughs> and watch them <laughs> wince like that, okay? It's a means of making sure teachers are delivering the curriculum that the government set out. I'm sorry, uh, it, this might sound a bit political, but that's what it is, okay? Um, and you're right, uh, it's three sheets to the wind. Uh, really, about education and policy. And what I would love to see is something perhaps more like the Finnish model, where to become a teacher, you have to be exceptionally well qualified, and then you are left alone because you are trusted, uh, because you are that exceptional teacher with that calling, and you are trusted to, um, uh, to deliver the curriculum um, that needs to be delivered. And uh, if you're thinking, well, why Finland? Well, Finland's important because it's always in the top three in terms of all the tests that they run um, on students. Um, whereas we're, I don't know, something like 20th. Okay? Um, trust your teachers. That's it. Let's go!